Hey, thank you for joining us uh, for this small business briefing. It is Monday, November 15th. Um, if you are not uh, sitting in a tree someplace, uh, you're, you're uh, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us at, at this briefing. Um, the briefing is brought to you by Marana Group. And uh, just as a reminder, if you're operating an e-commerce business, Marana Group can help you with uh, warehousing, order processing, and seamless distribution of your material. Uh, you can find out more at maranagroup.com. Um, I think we've been at this long enough. I'm Rob Fowler um, with SBAM. Brian Callie is, is the president of SBAM. So Brian, um, I, I feel like um, I, I'm torn a little bit. Seems like maybe we're coming to the end of this, that we are at least in the end stages. But I think it just sort of begs this question of how do we, how do you end um, a, a pandemic? Today it was announced um, that the state of Michigan reached the goal that the state set early on. 70% of our population 16 and over are now vaccinated. Uh, an even higher population is um, immune. Um, so when do we get back to, now I'm just gonna talk, you know, obviously our focus is on small business, but yeah, we, we've got this max, this vaccine mandate hanging over our heads. We've got other potential regulations kind of looming out there. What's your sense of how, how this, you know, where are we in the, in, the, in the process and what comes next? There is an important transition that needs to happen. And that transition is for us to move from, um, from where we've been kind of stuck for a long time to, uh, to how we, live with the virus and, um, and to, to associate the risk or to, to evaluate the risk in the context of all the risks that we, that we face. I think for some people, the, um, the virus still presents a very high level of risk. For most people, uh, because of vaccinations and, uh, and naturally developed immunity, um, it doesn't pose that great of a risk. And, uh, and so as, as we move forward, I think that the overall danger associated with the virus will likely continue to recede, and um, and so in terms of how we're living our lives, I think that's the that's the big question. When when will we be committed to uh, to to getting back to something that's you know more of a um, a resemblance to the type of life that we had before? So it's an important uh, question. A lot of it is tangled up in public policy, as you'd mentioned that. Uh, the, the mandate that, um, that is being challenged in court right now, some of the frustrations that the, that the federal government has, uh, is now kind of um, showing through their um, stretching the authority of, of, of OSHA to, to, figure, to, to fit in uh, to workplace safety and set a condition of employment uh, of, of this nature. I mean, it, it's definitely showing their frustration, but uh, but when you, you look at a lot of different other data and facts, and we'll talk about some of this, it's pretty clear that the workplace, the regular private sector workplace is not a problem. In fact, even when the, when before pre-vaccines, pre it wasn't the place where you had the, the majority of the, of the problems. And so um, the idea that they're taking this step, I, I think it's just really incongruent with, with the facts and the data behind the spread. Well, let's look at some of the data. Um, you know, it, it, it's kind of undeniable that we're we're seeing a slow surge. Is, it, is there such a thing as a slow surge? <laughs> um, but you know, and, and that's this is what weighs the other direction. That um, cases are up, hospitalizations are up. Um, let's take a look at the data and see what you know. Again, what everybody else is looking at. Yeah. So I'm gonna um, I'm gonna share with you. A couple of things. I'm going to start actually with um, with something that is not the um, hmm. COVID infection rates, and this is the um, this is actually the rise in personal income and the and the difference between that and the purchasing power of income. And so uh, this was in the Detroit News today. It was so insightful. I just thought I've got to got to show it to our audience. We have here. Um, this this line here, which is the rise in, in personal income, as you can see, it did you know drop last fall down, but then back up 5.1 percent. So, you know, really, really uh, solid. Except for when you consider 
that inflation, when you factor in inflation, the buying power of that income that rose 5.1%, the buying power when you take that into consideration is down 1.1%. Uh, so if you're out there and you feel like, man, my, my income is up and yet I don't, I'm, it's not, nothing's easier for me. Well, that's not just your imagination. That's the problem with inflation. So when you have inflation driven, um, an inflation driven economy, um, you'll see it, things like you know income rise is not terribly unusual, uh, but the amount that you can get for that income is uh, is less. So um, getting into the numbers, I thought I would start here with the regional look. The national numbers, we'll look at the national numbers in a minute, but when you break it out by region, I think it's a little bit more insightful because different things happen in different places. So light blue, you see the um, the south and especially like the southeast where the numbers have come down very substantially. That'll show up on the heat map very clearly. Um, other places, um, you know, in the in the west, the numbers are pretty level, um, but in the um, in the Northeast and um, in the Midwest is where you see the numbers rising, especially in the Midwest. And then Minnesota, a state that we've looked at quite a bit in the last uh, month, uh, you'll see when you when adjusted for population is the highest. So that's what's featured on here. As you see, Minnesota's numbers have jumped up quite a bit. Michigan's absolute numbers are higher than Minnesota's, but again, just adjusted for population, cases per 100,000, um, they're, the, they're the highest right now. But as you can see, this is the Midwest line that's in green, and the Minnesota line, you know, is kind of on the same trajectory, just a bit higher. Um, looking at the heat map, you'll see that you know last summer, where was it that we were all focused on? Down here, this uh, this area of you know Texas to Florida, up to Kentucky, Tennessee, North Carolina. Um, these areas had the highest numbers. Now they're the lowest, and they and they continue to fall. But it's kind of like a wave, and this is how it worked last year too. That wave, as it got um, as it got uh, through, as we got through the summer, just kind of pushed across up and west. And so you see Michigan and uh, Minnesota, the, the highest in the country right now. Uh, but Michigan also um, seeing kind of a slow motion wave that started last July, and um, and now we're four months into it. Uh, looking at the national numbers here in aggregate, you'll see that the, they've come down kind of leveled out and going up a little bit. And again, that's driven by a different region that that uh, drove the, the last wave. Um, hospitalizations over the um, over the, the country have come down a, a lot, although that is not the case here in Michigan, which we'll take a look at in just a minute. Uh, but we see uh, deaths continue to go down as well. As long as hospitalizations are going down, you can be assured that, that deaths will be going down too. And, um, and all the, the progress that's made with um, with uh, with immunity in the population is going to drive this number down in the future as well, um, e even with rising cases. But if you look at Michigan's cases, um, they've been kind of jagged. They're all over the board. There's been data reporting issues with the state, so they're up. And the numbers are up and they're down, and and um, and it's because there's delays in reporting, and it's making it look more jagged than what it really is. Um, if I look at just the last 90 days, you'll see what I mean when I say kind of a slow motion wave. It's just steadily going up, um, as you, but you can still see the reporting issues um, are, are making it look a little bit more, um, a little bit more jagged. But if you look at hospitalizations where it's not about the reporting, like people show up in, in hospitals regardless of how many people give te get tests, if you look at hospitalization in the last 90 days, um, you'll see it's been just a steady, a slow but steady increase. And uh, But it does look like as of late, it has been um, accelerating a bit. So it is uh, well over uh, 2,000 for context. At the highest, it was about 4,000, uh, 4,200 or so uh, patients. The um, And then if you look at um, deaths, I think as the further that we go on in this pandemic, you'll see this number separate out from the rest. So even when numbers go up quite a bit, you won't see as much um, as, as much death because of immunity that has um, that is built up in the in the population. So that's the um, you know I looked at a couple other states. So I didn't pull out um, Minnesota this week, but as you saw, Minnesota's looks like Michigan, only steeper in terms of its increase. 
I also uh, checked in on, uh, on Great Britain. Great Britain has had kind of a moderately high level of, uh, of cases, but their exceptionally high um, immunity that comes um, from high vaccination rates and, um, and uh, especially among people who are over 50 years old has kept their, um, the, the fatalities, the case fatality rates uh, very low. And so there's almost no relationship between infection rates and deaths in, uh, in Great Britain. So I think maybe a, a peek <clears throat> into what we might uh, experience in the future, but we probably have a, a bit of time to go before we um, experience the same thing here. Brian, a um, month, month or so ago, um, the, the data was pretty stark that uh, hospitalizations and deaths in particular were among the unvaccinated. Is it your sense that that is still the case? Yeah, so um, you'll see uh, 80 plus percent of inpatients in, um, in hospitals are, um, are, are unvaccinated. The, um, and here's the thing, and they tend, very, still very much tend though, the ones in the hospital tend to be older individuals. And most people, most people that are over age 65 today are, um, are vaccinated. And even a small number of breakthrough cases in that population can still land people in the hospital. So, um, so you know, the, the more frail your health, health is to start with a breakthrough case, even though the, the vaccination does provide a lot of protection, it's not absolute protection. It's kind of like brushing your teeth. It makes it a, a lot less likely you're gonna get a cavity, but it's no guarantee that you're not gonna get a cavity. So um, a lot of other factors that come into, into play. Yeah, all right. Hey, um, we've been talking about the um, the vaccine mandate or the OSHA uh, emergency temporary standard. Um, some action in the court, you know. So now we've been looking at the circuit courts uh, across the country. Have most of them have a suit filed uh, against OSHA seeking to stop the the mandate? A little bit of um, uh, action at the appellate level over the weekend. Yeah. So. Keep in mind that across the, the state, there's there are these different districts. So we're in the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, Michigan mm -hmm. is, with Ohio and Kentucky and West Virginia. The one you're hearing on the news is the Fifth Circuit. So it'd be like Oklahoma and uh, Texas, Louisiana. So in New Orleans, which is where they uh, where that court is physically located, um, Texas and other states filed suit. So they were able to get a stay, a temporary stay on uh, the OSHA uh, emergency temporary standard for mandatory vaccine and testing. The, um, so at that point, what the, co what the court said, even though they were pretty harsh about the, and, and pretty transparent about um, the, 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 how skeptical they are that the, the mandate for OSHA is legal, um, they still gave the Biden administration until the following Monday to respond to the request for a stay for this pause in the emergency temporary standard. The Biden administration did respond and, uh, and asked for the stay to be lifted so that it, it could be implemented throughout um, the coming months and uh, while it's working its way through the court system. The Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals then um, considered that request from the, from the states in their district and from uh, the Biden administration and came to the conclusion, not only that they were they going to leave the stay in place, but uh, until some other higher authority said that uh, said something differently, but they also prohibited, explicitly prohibited OSHA and the federal government from uh, taking any steps to implement this mandate. And so this emergency standard at the moment is truly on pause. So not only can it not go into effect um, in the in, in this case was just the Sixth Circuit. The other courts haven't had decisions yet. Or I'm sorry, the Fifth Circuit. Uh, ours is the sixth. The fifth uh, is the one where it's not only stayed, but this it has the effect of putting a stay on it nationally, though, because what they're saying to OSHA is you cannot take any steps to implement. Well. Mm -hmm. You know that if they're taking steps anywhere, they're taking steps everywhere, right? It's the same standard or rule across uh, across the whole country. So 
Um, so at this point, we, we find it uh, in stay. And then eventually though, what will happen, uh, and I expect this will happen maybe yet this month or very early in December, uh, the cases across the country will be consolidated into a single court of appeals. And from the single court of appeals, um, once it renders its uh, decision, then um, you can be assured it will land in the Supreme Court. So, so let's talk about that for a second. Um, there are nine circuits, is that right? Ten, ten uh, circuits? Uh, no, actually 13 uh, uh, plus the plus um, the Washington, D.C. Yeah. And there's action in each of those or potential action in each of those. When this happens, uh, often you see some consolidation. So you just you just mentioned that. How does that work? Uh, consolidation of the cases in order to, to have it looked at all as a national policy. So every once in a while, you'll have one of these cases where there are um, there's an issue and it comes up everywhere all at the same time. There's different lawsuits in different courts, and of course these these courts have different philosophies. So for example, the fifth circuit court of appeals is very conservative. Um, they were, it was almost a foregone conclusion that something like this, they would rule against. Frankly, I think it's almost the same in the sixth where we're at, but say if it was in DC or in, um, in the fir first circuit court of appeals. Or, or the ninth, the ninth is famous for being. Exactly. Yeah. And, and so that would, um, almost assuredly go uh, the Biden administration's way. So you have all these conflicting um, potential for these conflicting cases and there. Uh, and so what happens in the, in then is that there's a, a process by which one of those districts is picked to consolidate all the cases into. So there's a, a group called the Judicial Panel on Multi-District Litigation. And when this is activated, they have a process where they literally randomly draw. In fact, the rule says they draw out of a drum. <laughs> so I don't know if it's a spinning <laughs> drum or what, but um, but they put all the numbers for the circuit courts that have a case on this matter in them, and you can, and probably all of them do. I didn't go through and look at every one of them, uh, but but it would stand to reason that they all would, and then um, and then they'll randomly select one whichever one is selected will have a lot to do with whether or not this stay remains in place uh, or if it's lifted. I could easily see uh, some of these courts lifting the stay uh, later on, or uh, but either, either way, immediately if a stay is lifted or maintained, whichever party is the losing party, will go to the Supreme Court and ask for that to be changed. And that's how we know it'll end up at the Supreme Court. I mean, if I were a betting man, I'd say that uh, that, that ultimately the Supreme Court does strike down OSHA's uh, emergency temporary standard for several reasons. There's actually a lot of different ways that this could be attacked legally, uh, but I think it's a fairly good chance that um, that five, four, or even six, three, uh, the Supreme Court would go um, against it. But in, you really never know. We got some new justices on the court, and this is not the type of case that comes up all the time. So between new justices and a kind of a novel uh, case going through the, the process, you really can't be sure. So at the same time that is happening, and, and to be clear, um, we, we oppose mandates. We'd like to see this um, stay with upheld or the, the um, Supreme Court strike it down altogether. But at the same time, the OSHA is actually considering broadening, broadening it to smaller companies. Uh, and, and I mean, they've said they they believe that large companies had the administrative capacity and they weren't sure that small businesses did. And so they were uh, actively considering broadening to small businesses and they wanted to hear from small businesses. So we, we have a current, I mean, just today sent out a call to action. This one's a little unusual. It's not like call your congressman. Uh, call your senator. This one, this one's very different. Could you kind of talk a little bit about the process we are trying to uh, engage in right now? Yeah. So in administrative rules, it's the um, it's a there's a public comment period. That public comment period is open, and unfortunately, there's um, it's not as easy as our normal calls to action, where you just kind of put in where where you're at. It'll tell you who your representative or your congressman or whatever, and and you send out a communication. It's done. In this case, 
it's a, it's a formal public comment period, which is electronic, but it's a fillable form. So we are putting a link to an article that describes what how, how to engage in this. And then um, with a click through link directly to OSHA's public comment, um, public comment page where you can um, where you can submit your public comment. The reason that this is important, you might say, well, I don't have 100 employees, therefore it doesn't, <clears throat> it's not likely to affect me. The, uh, this emergency temporary standard explicitly started the clock ticking on, um, on public comment so that they could in the future implement a uh, vaccine and testing mandate for smaller employers as well. So this is not, this is not speculation. It is explicit in this rule. And so uh, if they don't hear from small businesses saying, hey, you know, the idea of me having to let somebody go or to take on um, the, the cost and the time and the inefficiency of, of testing, um, and like if they don't hear from us that it's a problem, then one assumption they might make is that it's not a problem. And so I wanna ask you to, uh, to consider going, um, take a look at the article. We've got some sample language that you could use essentially cut and paste, but you know, fill, there's a few things you're gonna to have to fill in and then, um, and then submit it. So it's a little bit more, um, but it sh still should only take you know, four or five minutes instead of 30 seconds um, you know, to, to, go, to go through it. I mean, I think that you really could uh, do it in a fairly short period of time. And um, you know, it's kind of like, um, kind of like when you talk about your, your kids, you don't wanna have any favorites, but there's one that's more, like in this case, this one's really, really important. This is more than just weighing in with an opinion to um, your representative or senator. Th this, is a, this is a formal process to let them know that this will be a problem. Therefore, you do not want to see um, this emergency te temporary standard go forward. So just, just a word on this, because I sometimes I hear uh, a re reluctance to engage with the IRS or OSHA or others for fear that you might end up on a list and um, be sort of targeted by that agency, that sort of re repercussions issue. From a practical standpoint, is that, is that likely? Is that something that really happens? Is it mythical? What, what's your sense? In the case of submitting a public comment, you can rest assured that there will be many, many public comments for and against this. The idea that, I mean, they don't have the, the staffing to go out there and, and broadly enforce the temporary standard as it, as it is. Um, so it seems very impractical that, the, that registering a, a public comment in, uh, in opposition to this would somehow lead to them wanting to, to go after you. Um, they'll, so I, I don't want you to be concerned about that. In fact, I've spent some time with, uh, with, the, with the locals, uh, with my OSHA, the Michigan OSHA, to talk about what is the enforcement philosophy going to be for this, you know, to the extent that they've decided and they're talking about it. And what I was told is that they expect basically two different uh, aspects, that, that Federal OSHA are going to give some industries of interest that they perceive to be higher risk, that they want um, proactive steps uh, taken to, uh, to ensure compliance. And then there's also gonna be response to complaints. You might recall that, um, that uh, complaints filed with MIOSHA previously was the main driver of when they would, uh, would visit and um, and do an inspection and or uh, issue a fine. So they'll be primarily responding to complaints, but also um, focusing on some industries of interest. As far as I know, that has not been published and there hasn't been a decision on what those industries of interest would be, but, uh, but something I think would be forthcoming, uh, certainly if the state was lifted. So um, just think, you know, that is if this becomes um, a, an effective rule, um, given all the court case discussion we just had, there's a chance that it might not. Remind us, if, if the court cases are not um, successful, what is the timeline for the effective date of this uh, new rule? So a, cu a couple of important dates to, to keep in mind. One of them is that the mask mandate of unvaccinated employees takes effect on December 6th. And, um, and so that's just around the corner. And now again, it's, you know, it's, 
it's since it stayed even in the fifth district, but now that stay prevents um, federal OSHA from doing any work on it at all. I, I think I think that that means that it's effectively stayed everywhere, uh, even if it's not technically stayed. How a local OSHA department might treat that? Are they they're not covered under the stay, so would they start to enforce? I think that's an open question. But anyway. Uh, there, December 6th and then uh, January 4th is the next very important date. Oh, by the way, um, on uh, the December date is also when they expect you to have a vaccine policy in place. We did put um, last week on our, or maybe it was two weeks ago on our, on our website, a link through to the model policy that, uh, that OSHA had put out, kind of a plug and play type, uh, type of, a, of a policy. Probably wouldn't hurt to just get that filled out and you know, stick it in a file and have it uh, just in case uh, something happened or something, you know, that you're ready if, uh, if the stay is lifted. But, um, but th those are the, the main dates. So uh, December 6th, January 4th, January 4th is when testing and uh, vaccine verification would have to take place. All right, let's, let's talk about booster shots. Um, current status is you can get a booster if you are um, you have health complications or you're in a high risk industry, which is not really well defined. Seems like booster shots for everyone are coming. What's, um, wh what do you hear that about that? So two main things on booster shots. Number one is uh, the, uh, the FDA is almost assuredly going to approve booster shots for everyone. So, um, so for I shot, I'm sorry all adults, so 18 and up is likely what they're likely to, uh, to, to approve. The, um, but it's also um, clear, and thankfully it's one of, the, one of the things that is clear, that booster shots are not contemplated in this emergency temporary standard. So in other words, when they say fully vaccinated, they're not talking about booster shots. So while it should be uh, available to everybody, it seems to be, at least at this point, a non-issue uh, in terms of compliance for the emergency temporary standard if it ends up going into effect. All right, all right. Um, one final issue to kind of unpack. Uh, we just have heard that uh, the United States just uh, saw another uh, record-setting uh, month of people quitting their jobs. Yeah, there's a, um, th this is an, another context I think it's important to keep in mind as we, you know, as we look at the, the vaccine mandate and the potential to, uh, to push a few more people or maybe a lot more, but regardless of whether it's a small number or a large number, the, the uh, labor force participation rate is already really low. And on top of that is a lot of changing in careers. The good news is that most people that are that are when that are quitting their jobs right now are doing so to go somewhere else. So they're not leaving the workforce altogether. Um, so you so you have a trans there's a, a transient impact of people changing into more open positions because of that. Over 10 million positions, over 10 million positions are open right now. And that's the whole population of Michigan, by the way. Yeah, Our population right. is 10 million people. That's how many open jobs there are out there. And so um, the, uh, so what's happening is creating opportunities. It's not a surprise, or if you think about it, really, if there's that much demand for people, and uh, and so you've got uh, employees that maybe are looking to to take a step up in their career, and um, and so that there's never a better better chance probably to do it. So I don't think that that's going to cool down where you see kind of people moving around, but it might be kind of a a, a point too to do an evaluation of anybody you can't afford to lose in your, in your organization and, and make sure that they're well satisfied with, with the type of, uh, of, of work that they're doing for you right now. But um, well over 4 million uh, people left their, uh, quit their jobs in, uh, in the month of October. And, um, and it's just, that's on the, he, on the heels of, of two other months that were pretty similar levels. All right, let's um, let's finish up. We we have recently um, announced a new member benefit. This one feels like it's just right in our lane. It's called a pooled employer plan, uh, and it has to do with retirement plans or four hundred one k plans. Pooled employer plan really just means that we could take 
the sort of purchasing power of a bunch of small businesses and get them a deal, uh, a cost structure that they couldn't get on their own. Uh, that is kind of fundamentally what we do as an organization. And this new um, capacity to put together a pooled employer plan is something that we've taken, taken advantage of. And we now have what will be a new pooled employer plan starting January 1. People can sign up for it today uh, for an effective 1-1 one, one, um, uh, 401k plan effectively. We're having a webinar this Thursday at 12.30, so the 18th at 12.30 to 1.30. You can find out more about a pooled employer plan. Brian, I know you're enthusiastic about this, this uh, pooled employer plan. What's your take on um, why people should give it, a, give it a look? What we've seen almost across the board is that whether you've wanted to offer a 401k style retirement benefit, but were too small to cover the administrative costs so it just didn't financially make sense, or if you're already offering one as a small business, that the benefits of, of sharing the, uh, the liability and shedding a lot of the, the liability that you may not even know that you have, um, and then, um, but also um, sharing in the administrative costs, it's a huge benefit. Um, at, at SBAM, we, we use the same things that we, um, that we have as member benefits as part of our uh, suite of benefits for our own employees. And um, it was really substantial, the difference that this made in terms of, again, reducing our administrative responsibilities and the costs that go along with it and shedding the, um, all the, the various forms of liability that come along with having a retirement plan. And so th this, is a, this is a big one. I mean, this is one to really pay attention to, um, especially if you're not currently offering a uh, retirement plan, but even if you are, this is um, very highly, highly likely to, to save, uh, to not just save money, but significant. At SBAM where we have 28 employees, um, it was uh, fourteen or fifteen thousand dollars in savings, right. and and so that's just better return back to uh, our employees and their retirement accounts. Yeah, some of that was uh, borne by the association, but some of that is direct benefit right back to the employees, and um, uh, you know that has a, a compounding effect as well. So. Good stuff. We hope you take a look at a, at our pooled employer plan. Uh, again, that webinar is this Thursday at twelve thirty. You can find out more at sbam.org. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, we'll be back here Thursday at three o'clock. Hope to see you then. See you on Thursday, everybody.